due to unfortunate plane problems and, and the like, uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Keith Stewart, is stuck where he started in Phoenix. Um, so he has graciously agreed to give us his talk as a speaker, uh, and I will control his slides. I was going to try to lip sync with Keith, but you'll, you'll notice Keith has a slight Scottish accent, and I couldn't quite do that. So uh, if you'll bear with us on the technology, um, Keith, are you on online? Can you hear me? Or can he I can hear in? you loud and clear, Brian. Can you hear me? Yep, I hear you. We're good. Good, okay. thank you. So um, the next speaker then is Dr. Keith Stewart, who is an endowed professor of cancer research at the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale. He is a physician in the Div Division of Hematology and Oncology. His research focuses on the biology and genomics and individualized treatment in multiple myeloma. He's had more than 20 years of sustained funded research. I think he is a great example of a physician scientist who works on discovery all the way to application to clinics. He serves uh, as, I think, the prominent position he serves at Mayo Clinic is he is the director of the Center for Individualized Medicine at Mayo Clinic. He's also the Dean for Research at Arizona, the Chair of the Research Operations Management Team, and a member of the Executive Operations Team and Clinical Practices Committee um, at Scottsdale, Arizona. So, Keith, if you can hear me, I'm going to turn it over to you, but let us welcome Keith Stewart. Perfect. First of all, everybody, I, I, I want to offer my sincere apologies for not making it there today. I was looking forward to the meeting very much. Uh, it was 122 degrees here at the airport yesterday, and um, my flight got cancelled, so I apologize uh, very much for that. Hopefully this will work out okay. Um, what I'd like to... Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Uh, what, I'd, what I'd like to do today is to, to divide the talk into three pieces. I... Um, Brian uh, uh, wanted me to speak about our work in oncology, but what I'd like to do is maybe just spend the first few minutes talking about the Center for Individualized Medicine and Activities in Pharmacogenomics at Mayo Clinic. The second part will be about our efforts in precision medicine and oncology, and I will close with a story from my own research in the multiple myeloma field. So uh, with that, Brian, if we could have the first slide. Okay, we're on my genome. That's it. So I would like to start with this. This is last October. I uh, went to an event called Understand Your Genome and had my own genome sequenced. The results of it are shown here. Um, interestingly enough, uh, there was a journalist at one of the talks I gave recently on this, and she actually tweeted all my abnormalities out to the world, so they're not very, pro not very private anymore. So here they are. Uh, First of all, she took the, the, at this event, uh, I was told I was a carrier of four conditions, spinal muscular atrophy, hemochromatosis, neiman pick disease, and galactosemia, none of which have ever manifested in my family. I was also told, perhaps more usefully, that I was a rapid metabolizer of the tricyclic drugs and statins, suggesting that I should be somewhat careful uh, when I take those drugs due to possibility of side effects and that I was a slow metabolizer of Coumadin, well, I, given that I should probably take higher doses of that drug were I ever to, to start it. Uh, I think pointing out one of the challenges of genomic sequencing today, I was also told that I had 600 potentially pathogenic variants of undetermined significance. Well, I sat there uh, during the day and I felt somewhat underwhelmed by this. After all the... Uh, excitement of having my genome sequenced really didn't feel that this was uh, terribly spectacular information I'd received. Uh, but as the day went on, if I could have the next slide, uh, Brian. As the day went on, what I realized was what I'd heard was, was not what was positive that was important, but what I'd been told was that I was negative for 1,600 other hereditary conditions, including familial risk of malignancy, and of neurodegenerative diseases. It struck me that although I'd only had my exome done and probably should have the whole genome done at some point, really there was no need for any future genetic testing in my case. If I got a DVT from traveling, uh, no need to test me for inherited predisposition. If I developed a 
a malignancy. No need to test me for an inherited predisposition to that either. And therefore, I felt like I'd lowered my future diagnosis complexity. I knew which drugs to avoid. And if this was uh, repeated for other people, overall, I'd lowered my future health care costs and delivered better quality health care to myself. My next slide, Brian. I went back to the, my colleagues at Mayo and I said, how many patients did we sequence last year? And the answer was 600 Mayo patients had their genome or part of their genome sequenced. It struck me we see 100,000 new patients per year. And if we could replicate my experience across those 100,000 people, or even half of them as shown here, that this would be a dramatic advance in the way we deliver health care. Next slide, please, Brian. So I wanted to just uh, begin by telling you what we've done at Mayo Clinic so far in delivering uh, genomics to our patient population. We're not at that point of being able to sequence 50,000 individuals today. But what we have, uh, Brian, there's an advance on this slide, so you'll just need to keep pushing with me. Uh, what, what we started off with, and I'll tell you our experience with, was whole exome sequencing for patients with advanced cancer. And with advanced, you'll see that our next um, intervention was in patients with likely inherited diseases who uh, had no diagnosis, which we call a diagnostic odyssey. And I'm not going to talk about that today, but I can tell you our success rate in those patients is 29% is of finding a diagnosis where there previously was none. Uh, next advance. We then introduced pharmacogenomic rules into the medical record, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. Next advance, we began to introduce cancer gene panels as it became clear that many patients didn't need their whole exome sequenced. And at the end, I'll tell you about my own experience in uh, multiple myeloma and doing this. Uh, we then introduced a predictive genomic service which offers carrier status testing, pharmacogenomic testing, and whole exome sequencing. Uh, the challenge with that being that the price of whole exome sequencing is still in the uh, eight to ten thousand dollar range, so not many takers on that right now. And then final, final advance, Brian. It should say non-invasive prenatal testing. Now, um, this is just recently introduced to uh, assist women with high-risk pregnancies and help them avoid amniocentesis by testing peripheral blood uh, for the fetal fraction of DNA to look for abnormalities. In amongst all of those things, the most important one and the one that we think will most likely uh, result in rapid uptake in our clinical practice is pharmacogenomics. Next slide, Brian. And we had conducted a pilot study, so this slide should say uh, clinical genomics for every patient, because we do believe this is the first thing we can introduce at scale. Uh, in a pilot study conducted by Dr. John Black and his colleagues at Mayo, we studied 1,013 Mayo patients from our biobank. And what was uh, fascinating here is that we found that 99% of those patients had some variant in their pharmacogenome that we thought was clinically uh, useful. We're expanding this this year to 10,000 of our patients, and I'll finish with that at the end of the talk. Next slide, um, Brian, I should read 21 drug gene rules. This is the number of drug gene rules that we've introduced into our electronic medical record with the intent is, and, and we have a, an audience full of experts in this, but obviously the intent is to reduce drug side effects, increase effectiveness, and reduce cost. And we've put a lot of investment into the education components of this, particularly educating our pharmacists, having expert pharmacists who can provide consultation, our physicians, and of course, even our patients. Next slide. Uh, so far, this has resulted in over 12,000 clinical alerts being fired when a physician tries to order one of these medications and gives them some guidance with respect to the pharmacogenomic implications of that result. Next slide. Um, we've introduced, as I mentioned already, our healthy genome program, um, shown here is the brochure. And again, this is a, uh, a brochure that offers pharmacogenomic testing to our executive health program at this point. And we think that one of the breakthroughs in this will be a dramatic reduction in the cost uh, we believe we'll be able to offer this in the sub-$500 range uh, by the end of this year, and that's partly in partnership with a company in Minneapolis called OneOm, next slide, who have produced uh, some software and, and uh, 
visualization reports which will accompany the pharmacogenomic testing that they offer at a very low price point. So we think this will be the first, uh, pharma, you know, first genomic intervention we can offer uh, to all of our patients at relatively low cost. Uh, the next slide, uh, Brian should read Taylor study at the top, and I just wanted to mention uh, that we're not immune to the notion that pharmacogenomic interventions are somewhat unproven in many cases. We are conducting now, and this is, uh, if you just hit all the advances here, um, Brian, until the, the one comes up that says primary outcomes at the bottom. Um, this, I just wanted to mention this clinical trial that we've been conducting for the last three or four years called the Taylor study. This is looking at the role of Plavix and its uh, effects on um, myocardial infarction, stroke, cardiovascular death, recurrent ischemia based on uh, CYP2C19 testing. Uh, this is, we think, the largest pharmacogenomic trial ever conducted and has accrued already uh, about 3,000 patients of a planned 5,000. Uh, next slide. So we'll finish. That. I, just, I just wanted to start with sort of an overview of, of what uh, the Centre for Individualised Medicine is doing in this space. And I want to turn my attention um, to the field of oncology, which is my own uh, specialisation. Uh, next slide, uh, Brian should read at the top, Individualised Medicine Clinic Oncology. I'll start with a case. This is uh, from a patient that was seen in Arizona. It's a 50-year-old uh, gentleman who was essentially bedbound. He had advanced cholangiocarcinoma, or carcinoma of the, of the bile duct. Uh, he had been treated for this n notoriously difficult to treat malignancy with conventional chemotherapy, gemcitabine and cisplatinum, first line. Uh, he had a short response, which is fairly typical, uh, with rapid disease progression. When he was seen, he was bedbound in pain, uh, not eating much, and with massive hepatomegaly, as I'll show you. At his diagnosis, he had been enrolled in our uh, individualized medicine clinic, and we had conducted whole genome and transcriptome sequencing on the patient and had subsequently taken biopsies at time of first relapse. On the next slide, uh, I'll show you what we found here. We found a novel mutation which basically resulted in ERB2 upregulation. He was treated with drugs normally employed in breast cancer, and you'll see here on the left of the slide. Um, a massive liver full of tumor and the response to these uh, breast cancer drugs, which would not normally be used in clangial carcinoma, which was quite traumatic. This remission lasted many months, following which he relapsed again. He was treated and found to have further upregulation of pathways surrounding herb 2 His therapy was adjusted and he has responded again and is currently still alive. We think we have given this patient uh, um, better quality of life for, for some period of months, if not years, and, and therefore this is a success story for precision medicine in the field of oncology. Next slide. We have 166 patients like this. This should read Genome Tumor Board at the top, Brian, slide 14. Um, we have 166 patients who have undergone clinical genomic testing and have been reviewed at our Genome Tumor Board. Many of these are panel testing, uh, particularly with foundation medicine, but there are also uh, a large number of patients have had whole exome and RNA sequencing performed. I wanted to share with you our results, which have been submitted for publication. First, we found we studied 100, of the 166 patients we reviewed, 142 successfully had a biopsy and genomic sequencing data returned. Of those, 65%, two thirds, were felt to have a potentially therapeutically actionable mutation. Now, one can debate uh, some of those uh, calls, but this is our, the conclusion that we made. However, of those uh, patients, of 93 patients, we, ha we thought there was something we could treat, only 29% received targeted therapy. The reason for this was that either the patient had progressed, waiting for the result to come back, because in the early days of doing this, it often took four to six weeks, uh, secondly, that even although we did find a actionable mutation, the physician or the patient chose more standard of care approaches. And third, less commonly, but certainly a factor, was lack of insurance coverage uh, to receive or lack of available drug uh, from the FDA or the drug company, even when the actionable mutation was identified and a drug was available. 
Of the patients who received targeted therapy, 25% responded to that treatment, giving us an intent to treat clinical benefit rate of 8% or 11 of 142 patients, which depending on how you read this is either encouraging or disappointing. Uh, certainly there is a large fraction of patients who had a mutation. If the drug had been freely available and if insurance had covered, I think those results would look uh, significantly better. Nevertheless, it does point to many of the challenges in treating patients with uh, a precision medicine approach in a real-life situation. Uh, next slide, please, Brian. We've also conducted, uh, on a more research uh, protocol-driven system, um, a number of clinical trials. I just want to spend a minute on the Beauty clinical study here. This is a study of 200, well, this should say Beauty project at the top of the slide, Brian. Uh, this is 200 women with invasive breast cancer. They have a biopsy before chemotherapy, they have a biopsy after the first chemotherapy, and they have a biopsy at the time of surgery. Mouse avatars are established, and we did genomic sequencing both of the tumor and the germline uh, DNA. Both at, uh, biopsy, both at all three biopsy time points with avatars attempted to be established at diagnosis and, and in the surgical post-chemotherapy uh, sample. Next slide. Uh, if you look at our uh, success rate in establishing a patient xenograft on this trial, we tried 128 times to establish a xenograft and succeeded 31 times or 24% of the time. But as you'll see there, the take rate was significantly higher and highest for triple negative breast cancer, a more aggressive type of malignancy, and for HER2 positive uh, tumors with very low uptake success rate for luminal A or luminal B tumors, which are traditionally uh, more, slower growing. Now, this isn't my work, but I will take you through in the next slide uh, some of the more interesting findings. Uh, here on the bottom is a lady who had a malignancy you can see in her right breast. And you can see after paclitaxel therapy, that's essentially eradicated. On the top of the slide, you will see the uh, six mouse avatars that were established from this patient's initial tumor and show that not only in, uh, in vivo, in the human, but also in the mouse, we were able to replicate that success with uh, paclitaxel in all six of the, the animals, suggesting that this approach uh, will be uh, useful for determining drug sensitivity. On the next slide, uh, you'll see the opposite is also true. Here's a woman on the bottom with an MRI that shows no response to paclitaxel chemotherapy before and after. And you'll see in the six avatars established from this lady's tumor that there was no response from this to taxol in the murine system either. So going into systems in which we can try and find new drugs or predict new drugs, on the next slide, uh, Brian, it should read rapid disease relapse. Here you'll see a lady who under, was on the beauty trial but unfortunately, four months after completion of her initial chemotherapy, had a very dramatic relapse as shown on the PET scan on the right of the slide, was quite symptomatic and was, uh, underwent a new biopsy. Now, interestingly, on the new biopsy, we found by RNA sequencing a fusion protein involving uh, the methyl transferase DNMT3A and DMT3B. Uh, we then went on to do some Western blots shown here, showing that before therapy, and after therapy, DNMT was upregulated in the residual tumor, suggesting that this might be part of the resistance mechanism. This, was then, uh, this woman's tumor was then established as an avatar uh, graft and a xenograft. And you'll see here that we used the drug decytabine, not a drug one would normally associate with treating uh, breast cancer, but rather this is used for myelodysplastic syndrome in, 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 in elderly patients, usually with hematologic problems. But you'll see here that compared to vehicle control, use of decytabine in this woman, uh, avatar at least, produced a fairly uh, marked response to her tumor. We didn't find many other examples of uh, uh, mutation in or fusion proteins for this particular gene, but we did develop the hypothesis that decytabine could, could be an effective treatment for breast cancers, particularly those with high levels of methyl transferases. And on the next slide, uh, now this should uh, show you uh, uh, three blue bar charts, Brian, uh, DMT, DNMT1 at the top and 3A in the middle. And you'll see here that when we look at expression of these proteins in different um, uh, subjects on this trial who had mouse avatars, you can clearly see some very low expressors and some very high expressors 
of this subset of genes. And we went on and took and made avatars from both the high expressors and the low expressors on the next slide. And you'll see that in the high DNMT group treated with decitabine, in all cases the tumor was stabilized or reduced in size compared to control, whereas as those in the low DNMT group we see a very little response. I suggest in this drug uh, decitabine may be useful in these, this subset of uh, my, uh, breast cancer patients. Next slide should read promote, uh, Brian, if we advance. Um, we've also done a similar study in prostate cancer. Uh, we had 91 patients on this trial. We're a crew. We did 159 biopsies. We only established a pharmacal uh, genet genetic mouse models in 10, my in 10 subjects. This was uh, much less successful than in breast cancer. It's probably because a lot of these biopsies were from bone, where prostate cancer metastasizes to but we are uh, continuing to analyze the results on this particular trial. Next slide. So uh, let me move on to the last piece of uh, the presentation, which is a little story from my own work. Again, I think hopefully you'll find of interest. So this is the, the, the blood cancer multiple myeloma. It's characterized, I should say that at the top of the slide now, Brian. It's characterized by excessive numbers of abnormal plasma cells in the bone marrow as shown on the right here. They're easy to, to identify. And these cells normally uh, overproduce an intact immunoglobulin or free antibody light chain. The disease is um, characterized by high calcium, renal failure, anemia, and bone disease, and is uh, fatal if untreated. Next slide. But the story I want to tell you today is about the drug thalidomide, and I'm, I'm sorry this comes out a little bit blurry here in my version of the slide anyway, but, uh, and the slide should say thalidomide at the top now, Brian. Uh, you'll, some of you will remember this drug, some of you may not. Thalidomide was, was really uh, the drug that established the, firmly the role of the FDA in drug approvals. It caused terrible birth defects, as shown here, uh, for children who, whose mothers consumed the supposedly safe drug uh, during the first trimester of pregnancy. Uh, the best thing that could be said about thalidomide at the time uh, was that it could not cause malignancy in animal models. Or, or mutation in animal models, and I'll explain why that turned out to be true in a minute. So the reason I'm going to talk about thalidomide, this terrible drug, is next slide, is that in 1999, uh, as shown here, it was serendipitously found that this drug was very active in multiple myeloma, the disease that both Brian and I have a specific interest in. It was originally tried because it was felt to be anti-angiogenic, but that turned out probably to have nothing to do with its uh, specific mechanism. So my lab became quite interested in how thalidomide worked, uh, as did many around the world, but there was really no significant advance or progress until uh, 2010. Next slide, uh, Brian. Um, in the meantime, clinically, there were three, new dr three drugs introduced into the clinical space that were all analogs of thalidomide, as shown here. The, the, the one in the middle, lenalidomide, on uh, this slide should say image structures at the top, Brian, the one in the middle, lenalidomide, um, is now uh, sells about $5 billion worth of drug a year. And pomalidomide, which is recently introduced, is the most potent of the three drugs and causes the least side effects. So one, these drugs are all chemically very similar, and yet as you change the chemical structure very subtly, you become much more potent. And as the drug becomes more potent in its activity, the number of side effects drop. And we felt that that probably indicated that they shared a common target and the more potent drugs were more effective and, less, and, and more able to be on target rather than off target like thalidomide. Next slide. The breakthrough came in 2010 uh, with a paper in science from a Japanese group who were quite interested in how thalidomide was causing birth defects. They labeled the drug, fished out of cells, binding proteins, and identified a protein called cerebron as the thalidomide binding protein. Next slide. They showed in this slide, and this should show you a zebrafish on the bottom with a normal fin uh, during development. And this is a, a, a zebrafish with intact cerebellum that is fed thalidomide. Sorry, with deleted cerebellum that is fed thalidomide in which there is no activity of the drug and, and inhibiting uh, limb development. On the top of the slide, however, is a fish with intact cerebellum that the drug combined to, and just like in humans, the fish limb development is, is dramatically uh, disrupted. Next slide. 
So Cerebon turns out to be a protein. It gets its name because it was associated with, with mental retardation in some early studies by GWAS. It is a cerebral protein expressed mostly in the brain with a long protease function. It's highly conserved both in plants and in humans. It is widely expressed. Next slide. We immediately uh, went to work on this when we saw this paper and obtained a lenalidomide-resistant myeloma cell line from colleagues at MD Anderson Hospital. And we showed that these uh, cell lines, both by PCR and by Western blot on the bottom of the slide, were completely lacking in cerebron. The drug activity is shown on the top left of the slide, showing that the cells that were grown in lenalidomide to become resistant are resistant, whereas those who were sensitive before exposure to the drug are still very sensitive in red. Next slide. We went on to show that the, the level of cerebron in a myeloma tumor cell completely predicted response to uh, one of these drugs, particularly if you look at the uh, far left of the slide, you'll see patients with the lowest expression of cerebron had 0% clinical response. In the clinic, these drugs work in about 30% of patients, and until now, it had not been known uh, how they were functioning. Next slide. Another breakthrough took place in early uh, 2010 with two papers from Boston that both showed uh, that the mechanism of action of this, these drugs was binding to cerebron with resultant degradation of transcription factors called Icarus and Iolus. And our own group at the bottom of the slide uh, followed about six months later with the same basic uh, conclusion. Next slide blind should be a cartoon in blue with the drug mechanism of action. It's a little bit tricky to follow, so stay with me for a minute here. But what happens with these drugs, all three of them bind to cerebron, which is part of an E3 ubiquitin ligase complex. They activate that complex to ubiquitinate the target proteins. The target proteins of interest are called Icarus and Iolus. They're transcription factors that are normally involved in plasma cell development or myeloma cell development. It turns out that by degrading these proteins through the proteasome, uh, two things happen simultaneously. First, usually this drug on the bottom right there, you'll see normally this drug is a, these, sorry, these transcription factors are suppressors of interleukin-2. So as soon as you remove Icarus and Iolus, interleukin-2 levels uh, go, go up very quickly and very dramatically, resulting in immune activation. At the same direct uh, moment, these transcription factors are usually uh, uh, stimulators or enhancers of two incredibly important proteins in myeloma called IRF4 and MYC. And when you remove these transcription factors, these proteins go down and the myeloma cells uh, die. So I think after 50 years of this drug, we've, the thalidomide, we finally understand completely how, it, how these drugs and its analogs work uh, through this uh, targeted pathway. Next slide. And I tell you this because it becomes clinically important. When we did our first whole genome sequencing in a myeloma patient who was very resistant to therapy, we found mutations in all three of the drug pathways this patient was being treated with, both cerebellon, as we've just described, which would make her resistant to these immune modulators, to the proteasome subunit G2, which would make her resistant to proteasome inhibitors, and to the um, glucocorticoid receptor. Next slide. They should read myeloma mutation panel, M3P, Brian. Well, we took this information and went back to the clinic now and decided to build a mutation panel around a myeloma mutation. There's been over 1,000 myeloma genomes sequenced. We know all of the common genes that are mutated, and we put them on this 88-gene panel. But you'll notice in the middle of the slide, we included drug-resistant genes, including the cerebellum pathway. Next slide. We went on to study patients who had become resistant to thalidomide, lenalidomide, or pomalidomide, and found that, in fact, mutations in this pathway are quite common in the relapsed refractory multiple myeloma setting. We found mutations in 26% of patients who, in whom the physician thought they were resistant to these drugs. We also had a cumulative body of evidence which suggested this is the right pathway to be studying in that we found, uh, for example, in the second bullet there, one patient with four different mutations in cerebron. Uh, one patient was clearly refractory to lenalidomide uh, mutations of both cerebron and IRF4. And for the IRF4 gene, we found a hotspot in four out of five mutated patients. 
So this is a story of a bench-to-bed site where the discovery of Cerebron as a target for these drugs led to clinical investigation, development of a gene panel, evidence that this is an important panel that can be used in real time in patients, and this panel will be brought up as a clinical test uh, this summer at Mayo Clinic and has been licensed out to another company to develop nationally. Uh, here's an example on the next slide of a, a patient of mine that once the panel was available, uh, we identified who was progressing on pomalidomide therapy. We sequenced the tumor at 700x depth and found a mutation in the Aeolus gene suggesting this patient would, would not respond to these drugs and should be treated with something else had we known this uh, prior to initiating therapy. Next slide. So let me close now uh, with uh, just going back to our Center for Individualized Medicine and just comment on where we're heading with this. This is an advanced slide. Uh, it should say promise to practice at the top, Brian. And if you just advance, you'll see that our first uh, advance, we're moving our pharmacogenomics efforts into a 10,000 patient study. We're doing this in collaboration with Baylor University where 83 genes will be sequenced. The results will be delivered back to us along with a clinical report from this CLIA, and they will be sequenced under CLIA conditions. We plan to put these uh, results in the patient's medical record and study what happens to their medical uh, drug prescribing both before and after uh, this information is available. Next advance, we're moving into cancer mutation liquid biopsy to look at the role of uh, peripheral blood uh, circulating DNA and detecting early relapse or even diagnosing cancer in healthy people. Next advance, we are beginning to study in a big beauty type study or promote type study uh, immune oncology drugs. There are, these are obviously, as many of you know, these are revolutionizing cancer therapy today by stimulating T cell function. But these are incredibly expensive drugs. Only about a third of patients respond in some indications and it's still very unclear who responds and who doesn't, so we want to explore that. Next advance, you'll see that we're going to move into the area of solid organ transplant, particularly uh, immune re looking at the um, effects of um, rather than measuring drug levels of cyclosporin or tacrolimus in the blood, looking at their actual impact on the immune system uh, using gene expression to see if we can lower immunosuppressives and, and have better long-term outcomes. And last advance, our work is expanding both from the human genome into the microbial metagenome, which I actually personally think is probably one of the more exciting areas of the future. So I'll close there. The very last slide, uh, Brian, it should just be a, a, a closing slide to say thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I couldn't be there. And if there's any time, I'd be happy to take any questions. And I hope you can still hear me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Keith. Uh, we heard you fine. Uh, I think all the slides advanced on time, so I think we got the, the full picture here. Uh, just to give you a full picture, I'm looking out the window. It's sunny blue skies and about 75 degrees outside. I know. I'm jealous. Uh, <laughs> um, we were going to reserve the end of the session um, this afternoon for a panel discussion for questions, but so we don't have to keep Keith on the line later for the panel discussion, uh, we could entertain a couple of questions now. If anybody has any questions for Dr. Stewart, um, there are microphones standing there. I'll, I'll ask one if people want to go up and ask a question. Uh, Keith, the avatar results you showed uh, were very impressive, but obviously they, they are selected on maybe some success cases. Do you have examples where the avatar had a completely different response than the patient themselves? Uh, you know, that's a great question, Brian. I don't know the answer to that. This, uh, this is not my own personal work. I'm presenting the work of uh, some of our team at Mayo Clinic. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. But uh, yes, you're right. They're showing uh, the successes. I, that's an excellent question. I just don't know the, know the answer. And one other question. If you have a question, Pam? Pam, our director of the conference, has a question. Yeah, Keith, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. What do you think oncology will look like in 10 years? Do you have a vision of how the practice oncology, how, how will it look in our clinics in 10 years? You know, I am, I am, despite some of the results which have come out, 
suggesting that um, genomic sequencing hasn't impacted therapy terribly much. I think what we have seen over the past decade is an incredible shift towards targeted therapies and towards immune-based therapies. So I think, honestly, that conventional chemotherapy is a failed experiment. I think we will see a gradual decline and eventual eradication of conventional cytotoxic chemotherapies and that most of our patients will be treated with targeted therapy, uh, which probably won't need whole exomes because we will have a much better, clearer understanding of the, the exact lesions we need to be querying in each patient. Uh, so I think it will be targeted therapy supplemented by uh, immune oncology drugs, particularly the uh, and perhaps uh, cellular therapy products, which such as chimeric antigen receptor engineered T cells. So I, I suspect, in my own opinion, this will be a gene panel based targeted therapy and immune oncology based therapy, and that we won't see much more cisplatinum and adriamycin in the future. Well, thank you very much, Keith. Uh, let's thank Keith Stewart again for a great presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you, Brian.